Welcome to Engaging with Psychoanalysis. I'm Tom Schumann. I'm a mental health counselor interested in better understanding the theory, history, and practice of psychoanalysis. I aim to do so through discussions with practitioners, thinkers, educators, and others involved in the psychoanalytic tradition. If you're interested in being a guest on Engaging with Psychoanalysis, please email me at engagingwithpsychoanalysis at gmail.com. Thanks, and enjoy the show. In this episode, I spoke with Dr. Frank Summers. Dr. Summers is a training and supervising analyst at the Chicago Institute for Psychoanalysis. He has written and lectured extensively on object relations theories and other psychoanalytic topics. His most recent book, The Psychoanalytic Vision, was the 2013 winner of the Grandiva Award for Best Psychoanalytic Book. In this talk, we discuss the value of psychoanalysis for society and what it has to contribute to the social order. To introduce you with? Okay. Sure. That's fine. Yeah. All right. Great. So uh, if it's all right with you, we could get right into it. Um, sure. We had talked about uh, discussing what psychoanalysis has to offer society. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, I have some thoughts about that, some questions about that, but I guess what does that mean to you, the societal potential? Okay. Um, you know, we've only got a quarter to two, so, you know, I'll try to uh, keep my remarks within the uh, time limit because I could talk forever about that. I think, you know, it's a, sort of an, uh, an, it's a kind of passionate interest of mine because, um, you know, I can't do it without uh, providing the context, societal context. Um, our society has gone, as many have, has gone increasingly toward the objectification of the human being, is the mm -hmm. simplest way I can put it. Um, the um, primary values of American society, the most dominant values, not the only values, but the dominant values, are quantification, materialism, and what that means is that the everything is valued in terms of its quantity, okay? Um, you know, people talk in terms of their net worth as the amount of what their portfolio is, right? That's a quantity, mm -hmm. you know? Um, you wanna know how the society is doing? Go to the GNP, right? Or the DPN, right? It's quantity, you know? What, what is the, the quantitative value of the society? Um, quality has been sort of long forgotten if it was ever important, it certainly seems to be receding in importance, okay? Mm -hmm. So the tendency in all of that is to objectify human beings, okay? Um, human beings have become commodities, and that this is not something new, it's not something from the this decade or last decade, this has been going on since the, um, since the, really since tech, since the advent of modern technology. You know, Heidegger, of course, makes a major point of this in his paper on technology, his, his really book, really, on technology, um, that the um, technological process has led to um, a kind of a deification of whatever can be quantified. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, um, the what that means is that... Um, that we look at things in terms of of what can be added, what can be counted, what can, okay, and the 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 one of the few um, uh, disciplines that really should be in opposition to this has com instead of being opposed to it, which is psychology, mm -hmm. has been completely co opted by it, mm -hmm. so that psychology itself has become a, one more manifestation of the objectification of the human being. So, you know, you have in academic psychology um, a um, gradual and increasing uh, elimination of anything that, that's about human experiencing, okay? Yeah. Um, because it's only what can be quantified that matters. If you look at any introductory textbook to psych in psychology, they how do they define psychology? They define psychology as the study of 
uh, living organisms. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, well, why is that the definition? That that's the definition, and they state this explicitly, is because that's what can be observed, mm -hmm. okay? Which is um, completely backwards, okay? Psychology must be the only discipline where you define the discipline by method rather than the other way around. Mm -hmm. It would be like saying economics is statistics or archaeology is defined by digging, okay? Mm -hmm. So they take the method first, which is whatever can be observed and therefore quantified, and then say, well, then that's the discipline because of what can be quantified. But there's no argument made because no argument can be made for why that is the proper way to study human experience. Okay, so human experience gets squeezed out of academic psychology, and that's what's happened. Okay, psychoanalysis is one of the few bastions of human subjectivity, of human experiencing. Um, there's very little left in our society where that's important, okay, where that counts, where it's even recognized, okay, and that's why I regard psychoanalysis as so important at a societal level. It's not just about the treatment of individuals, which is, of course, very important. That's what I spend most of my time doing, is treating individuals, right? But when I treat individuals, I am interested in their experience, right? I'm trying to help them with the way they experience the world, other people themselves, okay? Um, and that's where I think when you look at, uh, at, at the national level, at national discourse, right? You don't hear anything about that. You only hear about the quantification of people. How many of this, how many of that, okay? When you wanna to try to understand uh, somebody or some phenomenon, um, people will talk about biology. They may talk a little bit about maybe some human factors, but they're very superficial because the experiencing of human subjects, human subjectivity, is not part of the national discourse. And that's where I think psychoanalysis is absolutely essential, not just for the treatment of individuals, but for the national dialogue, for our way of understanding people, for our way of approaching people, okay? And you see that with um, the most contemporary forms of technology, in, you know, in, um, in the form of uh, our iPhones and our computers and all the rest of it and the way um, social media has taken over in lieu of human interaction. Social media, now it's not the media's fault, it's people using media, I understand, but social media is given the opportunity for people to communicate without human interaction, okay? Um, and if you read Sherry Turkle's book, which I think is very damning about this issue, Alone Together, I don't know how many people have read it, but um, what she says is adolescents communicate, they don't even use email anymore, right? Everything is texting, okay? And they'll even say they don't know how to hold a conversation because they don't, and they don't want to hold a conversation because it makes them anxious, okay? So texting gives the opportunity to, to communicate uh, without having to uh, have a conversation with another person, without having to respond spontaneously, without human experiencing being an issue at all. And so um, psychoanalysis, like I say, is one of the few areas left in our society where people are treated as people. And I think where, where psychoanalysis can offer a great deal to contemporary society is to bring in human experiencing at the level of discourse about what we do as a nation um, and how we operate with each other, what we believe in, okay, what our values are. I mean, those are things that you just don't see uh, in the national discourse because uh, insofar as you have people at all, they're treated like, uh, as, as Heidegger says, as points in homogenous space. Mm -hmm. as objects, okay? And the subjectivity, the human being, the, the being of what it is to be human uh, is not part of national dialogue. And you see the, the casualties of that in, in young people who, can't talk, who cannot hold conversations. You see it in uh, the high divorce rate. You see it in the way people can't relate to each other, um, how frightened people are of relationships, of relating to each other. Um, and so it's not like this is just some kind of sort of academic musing of mine. This is um, a direct, um, this is a direct causal relationship, I think, between the conceptualization we have of human beings as objectified and 
all the societal issues we see, the trial and uh, and substance abuse, the the incredible amount of substance abuse, the increasing amount of gambling addictions. Um, there's there are very direct consequences uh, in societal terms of the inability we have to relate to each other in terms of our experiencing. And that's where psychoanalysis really has a critical role to play, which is not playing right now, but potentially could play. And I, I could go on and on about that, but I know you don't want me to just talk about that. No, it's, it's, uh, it's perfect. But um, yeah, I, tying it to like substance abuse or other things where you're really seeking a visceral thrill, you know, the, the way you're describing it, it always almost makes me think like, the the movement of society is to turn human experience into concrete information and Mm -hmm. what's being lost is sentiment uh abstract experiencing that can't really be put into these uh you know it can't really be stripped down to a transmittable uh or uh replicable um form so I, I, it makes me think, well, what's it feel like to be drunk? It, it feels romantic. It feel It's all feeling. The same thing with gambling, that in a society where you are turned into information, there's a, probably a flight into sentiment, a flight into these less graspable uh, experiences. Yeah, no, I, that's exactly right. That's that's well put and it's um, really drawing out uh, the connection that I just kind of went over schematically. Um, if you talk about gambling addictions, which I see more and more of actually in my practice these days uh, is a perfect example. So is, so is alcoholism, so is uh, drug abuse. Um, they're all of a piece in the sense that they're distractions. They're distractions from an emptiness that mm-hmm. people feel, okay? And you're right, it's a desperate effort to try to feel something. OK, and and the um, what gambling does is it provides that sort of immediate thrill, you know, like uh, the fantasy is, of course, I'm going to make a lot of money and just to pull the slot machine or play this poker game or something and and make a lot of money. So there's an excitement about that. And it's a very temporary uh, excitement. It wears off and you wind up losing a lot of money. But then you go back because uh, you want that thrill. OK, hmm. um, I mean, the more it doesn't work, the more you do it because you're trying to get that thrill that you're missing out on. And you're convinced that there is a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Right. That that you can really do it if you just try harder, or, you know, do it more. It's going to somehow work. And the same is true for um, uh, eating disorders, uh, for alcohol, drugs. Um, you know, you take the drug and it's a temporary thrill. Right. You feel something. So it feels good because it um, it eliminates that emptiness, um, it eliminates the angst of existence that people don't confront and are afraid of. Right. It eliminates it for the moment. OK. And then when the drug wears off, you're back to feeling the emptiness, the um, the uh, the anxiety, the angst of of daily living that you can't deal with. So what do you do? You go back to the drug. Right. And. The more you use the drug, the more you use the drug, right? Uh, Keep looking for that um, experience that's going to take away all this emptiness. And, of course, it only does it temporarily. And so you have to keep going back to it. And that's true for eating disorders or um, alcohol. I mean, it's why we have so much addiction uh, in the contemporary world. Um, It's just like you said. It's that it's a desperation to try to feel something to get rid of the emptiness. And the emptiness has to do with the societal uh, constructions that we have in which people are objectified, right, as as commodities. And you become a commodity, you don't have anything uh, of your own experience that's at issue or you can even pay attention to, right? Because you gotta get to that bottom line. You get to the bottom line, not by feeling, but by doing things without feeling. And so, Affect is suppressed, which to some degree it has to be, but it doesn't have to be in the wholesale way that we do it. And so when one looks for some kind of actual human experience, you look for some immediate thrill like uh, the substance, uh, like food or gambling. So 
psychoanalysis offers another way to approach human experiencing but at the same time uh this kind of uh quantitative turn in society it attacks psychoanalysis because it, it, it's it's hard to empirically uh quantify the re- uh the results of it it's hard to I mean, it's hard to find concrete correlates to some of the concepts that are that are, you know, foundational to psychoanalysis. So how Mm -hmm. uh, assuming the potential for psychoanalysis to remedy this issue, what is how is that done with so many barriers built into the issue? Yeah, well. I mean, this is discussed in my book, The Psychoanalytic Vision, um, in which I um, I discuss exactly that issue. And that's why I start with the epistemology, you know, with the um, because when you start with the assumption that something has to be quantified, OK, then you've lost the battle right there, okay? Because if it has to be quantified, you're gonna eliminate everything that has to do with human experience, right? And that's where the battle has to be fought, okay? The, there's no justification in the academic world. The psych, psychology in the academic world claims to be scientific. They claim to be basing everything on truth and on evidence, okay? but on what do they base their very definition of psychology, okay? On what do they base their method for psychology? They don't base it on anything. You know, there's a famous statement by, statement by E.L. Thorndike, he said, which, on which academic psychology is based. He said, if it exists, it can be measured, okay? Well, E.L. Thorndike could not measure that statement, okay? I mean, E.L. Thorndike could not measure uh, that statement, any justification for that statement, okay? Because the fact is, uh, so many things exist that cannot be quantified, mm-hmm. okay? Human experiencing cannot be quantified, okay? Um, there's so much about the quality of the world in which we live that's not quantifiable. So the battle has to be fought right there, where, yes, it can't be quantified, so what, okay? The most important hu- of human experiences cannot be quantified, okay? People fall in love. Try to quantify it, which, of course, some researchers have done, and they come up with these superficial, you know, categories and, and markings and, and numbers, and it has nothing to do with love, okay? Nothing to do with the, what happens when people fall in love with each other, okay? So you take everything that matters to people, and you eliminate it, okay, from the start when you do that. So how do you, to answer your question, how do you attack that issue? You attack it by questioning the very assumption that anything has to be quantified before it can be somehow verified or real, okay? Um, the person who tells me that, well, if it, you know, it, it can't be quantified, I say, well, how do you quantify that statement right there? You know, and they can't do it, okay? Mm-hmm. I remember when I was a graduate student, um, uh, one of these methods guys, you know, spoke to our class, and, you know, a clinical psychologist, and, you know, said exactly this about, you know, the quantification, and I said, how do you quantify that statement? Or how do you base that statement? And, what, you know, and he couldn't answer it. And he said, well, I get increasingly annoyed with these people who say, take your computers and go home. He totally avoided the question because it's not answerable, okay? Mm-hmm. And these people who say everything is based on evidence, they have no evidence for the very postulates on which they base everything, okay? So that's where it has to be fought out. And you say, look, the reality is that most of what we do and matters to us as human beings is not quantifiable, okay? It's quality, it's human experiencing. And the only way you can really in, you can really study human experiencing is by human experience, is by engaging the experience of the other, okay? And that's what psychoanalysis does, okay? So when people tell me that psychoanalytic concepts can't be quantified, I say, you know what? Tell me why that's important. Tell me why that matters. Are you telling me that that's not real because it can't be quantified? Because then you can attack it right there, okay? On what basis? It's an ontological statement that's un- not justifiable, okay? So, um, in fact, you know, um, in regard to what you said, there are correlates between psychoanalytic concepts and brain processes, okay? I don't rely on that as an argument. It is true. I mean, you can do that. I mean, Chicago analysts right here have 
uh, done studies of you know correlating uh, psychoanalytic concepts with uh, biological processes or brain processes, and that's fine. People want to do that; it's true. But to me, that's not the argument because all that means is that there's a biological correlate or a brain correlate. Okay, it doesn't define the phenomenon itself. If you want to talk about what uh, dreaming is, you have to understand the experience of dreaming. If you want to talk about um, uh, fantasies, uh, desire, you have to engage people's fantasies and desire to know what that's about. You could try to measure it, but the measurement isn't going to tell you what the desire is all about. It isn't going to tell you about the human experiencing. So um, what I say is that uh, we engage the argument on the basis of questioning the assumption of quantification and pointing out to people that what matters to them most is not quantifiable. It doesn't make it not real. It makes it difficult for the method that is presumed. And it's that method that has to be questioned and actually put out of play. Okay. Cause that's not the method for understanding human experiencing. So you want to follow up on that? Go ahead. Well, um, because mm-hmm. generally when I think of challenges, to the hard empiricism in psychology. I think of uh, humanistic psychology, the third force. And, um, and, and also constructivist psychology. Mm-hmm. And I think what kind of sounds like the difference mm-hmm. by this, uh, but you're kind of uh, formulating as a psychoanalytic challenge to empiricism is you're not saying so much it's unknowable or there might not even be an objective truth to grasp onto. You're saying that's not how we do it, at least not completely. It's not going to be all through empiricism or quantification. It, a lot of it's going to be relational and what comes out there is going to have a fundamental, a fundamental truth, not just a constructed truth. Mm-hmm. Right, right, absolutely. Yeah, no, I do believe in reality. I do believe in truth, and it is a different argument from, let's say, the constructivists. Um, some of whom are analysts. You know, there's a confluence there, a connection between the two. Um, but um, in humanistic psychology, I think you know they have a lot of the same arguments that I've offered here uh, against the uh, assumption of quantification, but um, their way of approaching human experiencing to me is um, too superficial. It only deals with what's available consciously to people. And I think denies the importance of uh, history, culture, um, and what human experiencing really is about the depth of human experience. Um, you know, um, it, it would be superficial to say um, that we're going to only deal with what's consciously available to people and there's no such thing as what's not conscious. And, and you know, that simply doesn't hold up. I mean, there's so much about what we do that we're not aware of, right? That um, to really study human experiencing, you have to get into what's less than conscious, okay? And what's potentially conscious that can be brought out as consciousness. Um, so, that's my argument basically with humanistic psychology. I understand the the spirit of it in a sense is a positive thing. They, they're they opposed to the objectification of human pro- experiencing, but then their view of human experiencing does not carry the depth that I think um, is there. I mean, the uh, it doesn't capture um, the complexity of psychological states, the complexity of human beings, the depth of conflicts that people have, and so much of which people are not conscious of, and needs an inquiry, a depth inquiry to bring out uh, what is not conscious, uh, because so much of what is not conscious is what's driving us. And if we're not aware of that, we're not really studying the human experiencing, and fully we're only studying its more superficial manifestations. If through uh, through psychoanalytic thinking, mm-hmm. there were societal changes that mm-hmm. allowed for a greater appreciation of uh, non-quantifiable human experience. Mm-hmm. 
what would that look like? What would that, I mean, that's a huge question, I realize. But it's a huge question. It would mean that, that the values of, of the society would shift to quality. We wouldn't be asking, what is the uh, GDP, I think they now call it, gross domestic product, uh, the GDP to assess the value of society. We'd be asking, um, is this a society that helps people live satisfying lives, okay? Um, not an easy question to answer, but that would be the question instead of going to what the economy does in terms of uh, concrete objectified numbers. Now, to some degree, you have to do that because there is such a thing as poverty and poverty is never a good thing. And you wanna, you know, you can measure a society to some degree by uh, the kind of economic um, situations that people live in, but that's only a part of the picture, okay? Um, if it weren't, how come there are so many wealthy people who commit suicide? How come there's so many wealthy people who are unhappy, who are uh, the closet alcoholics uh, of, our, of our society? And there's so much substance abuse. I mean, very wealthy people, you know, one of the things they do when they make a lot of money is they start snorting coke. OK, well, if it were all about e economics and money, why would that be the case? OK, so uh, what, what it would mean is that we'd be our discourse would be different. We'd be talking about different things. OK, we'd be assessing a society based on how much creativity is there, how much understanding of human experience is there, how much gratifying human experience is there. OK, um, you know, you we've come to the point where everything is so quantified, okay, that anything you do is is ranked, right? They rank artists, who are the 10 best artists, okay? Who are the 10 best athletes? Who are the 100 best this and the 20 best that? It's everything is reduced to a quantification, okay? Instead, we'd be asking, what is the value, okay, of playing athletics, okay? What is the value of art, okay? And how much art, um, do we have in our culture that is helping people uh, appreciate life in deeper ways, okay? We'd be asking those kinds of questions, okay? We'd be looking at the quality of human experiencing and looking at a society in terms of how much it uh, contributes to the, value, to the level of experiencing and the richness of experience. Um, and we'd be looking at jobs that way, be looking at companies that way. Mm -hmm. How do we assess companies? You know, almost, 100% of companies, and I wouldn't say totally 100%, but almost 100%, are looking at one thing, the bottom line, okay? If it's making profits, whatever is making the most profit, that's the most successful company. Successful company equals what's making the most profit, okay? But that tells you nothing about the experience either of the employees of the company or of the customers, okay? The people who are getting the service, whatever it is, or the product or whatever it is. Instead, we'd be asking, okay, um, what does this company do for its employees, okay? Are they so structured that the employees are living, are satisfied with their work, okay? That they're living lives in which they feel gratified by what they're doing, okay? And whatever the company is producing, how much, um, how much value does that have to human beings, okay? Does that produce something that make, gives people happier, more satisfying lives, right? Um, those would be the kinds of questions we'd be asking instead of what the bottom line is, okay? There are a couple of exceptions um, to the rule, and I think it's important to bring that out, like Patagonia, for example, is a company where the uh, guy who runs it, his name escapes me at the moment, um, understands this, okay? And one day a year, he takes everybody from the company skiing. Most of the time, he's not around, okay? He says, they know more about it than I do, right? And he insists on people taking time off. Uh, they can take the time off when they feel they, they need it. They don't have to fit any kind of schedule of only so many weeks vacation. He cares about that they get the work done. They get the work done, they can take as much time off as they want. He's concerned that the employees are happy and satisfied with what they're doing, not just how much money they're making. And it's an extremely successful company, so it's not like it's hurting them. So there are exceptions, but those are exceptions. They stand out because they're exceptions. But that would be the kind of thing that would happen if we had uh, a psychoanalytic 
a society built on more psychoanalytic principles, principles that were about human experiencing and not about quantifications. I, I, uh, I'm curious, you know, with this view in mind, uh, mm -hmm. in clinical work mm -hmm. with individuals, mm -hmm. do, do you focus on getting patients to think of themselves uh, in a less quantitative way? Well, the way I would put it is this. It isn't that people think of themselves so much quantitative, but you're on the right track. Um, almost inevitably, um, patients um, reify their psychological processes. And it's that reification that is the manifestation of what I'm talking about. Okay? So somebody is depressed and you talk to them about their depression and what you know what experiences they've had that made them depressed and they'll say this is how i've been all my life this is just just how i am that just i'm just how i am in other words they're reifying it as a as though it's a given thing okay they're really in a sense objectifying themselves because they're treating their depression or whatever it is whatever the issue is as a thing whatever their process is is just a thing that that's the way it is the same way a table is a table or a chair is a chair okay this is just how i am and one of the first things i try to do when we get to that point and it's often very early is to get rid of the just okay um there's no just about it okay it's yes you have been this way all your life Okay, that's true. The just is not true. Okay, because there's a reason why you've been this way all your life. Okay, so in whatever we're doing, okay, in psychoanalysis, there are a lot of different kinds of psychoanalysis, as you know, and there are different ways of approaching people. But whatever we're doing, there's always uh, within uh, the psychoanalytic process, there's always uh, a goal of transforming that reification of people's own psyches into seeing their their experience as a process as something that has been created between them and the people who brought them up their early caretakers other experiences and influences in their life have led to a way of experiencing the world okay and that cannot be reified that's a way of experiencing the world it's a pattern a way of being okay that has been constructed and as being constructed it can be deconstructed and it can be transformed it can be modified it can be changed okay and that's what people don't see so what i'm saying here at a societal level is extremely important in the clinical process because what we're always trying to do is uh transform people's tendency to reify their experience and to recognize their experience as just that it's human experiencing ways of human being okay that have been created in certain ways and therefore can be recreated or transformed or restored in different ways okay based on new human experiences which is what the analysis does you give people a new experience in which they can then experience themselves differently okay um so um you know there's a a famous analyst, I don't know how familiar you are with the analytic literature, but uh, Peter Fonagy is a famous uh, English analyst. Um, he talks about uh, what he's doing with patients is trying to, um, that people are operating at the level of what he calls psychic equivalence, by which he means the psyche, psychological process, is treated as equivalent to a thing, to an object, okay? And that what you're trying to do is get people to out of that sense of psychic equivalence into what he calls mentalization mm. to see you, that what you're doing is mental is something that's a process that's been created okay and that's Feinig's way of saying in a sense what i'm saying here it's not just true of some patients it's true of all patients uh, it's really fascinating it's a lot to chew on um I'm going to add one thing here to, to what I was saying. Um, the, Chris Kip Bolas, who's an English analyst that retired now, um, uh, makes the distinction between fate and destiny, which I use all the time in my thinking. Okay, Fate comes from outside. Destiny comes from within. Okay, um, 
almost every patient I have believes they are fated. Whatever they're doing, whatever's going on, they're fated to do it. That's the just depressed or just whatever, right? Um, destiny comes from within. And one way of looking at analysis, it transforms that sense of fate into a sense of destiny. Destiny is your nuclear self, who you most authentically are. That's your destiny. And what analysis does is brings out the uh, potential from each individual. It brings out that potential nuclear self so that one can live it in the world, okay? The degree to which people live according to their authentic, authentic experiencing is the degree to which they're happy by and large. Okay, so I just wanna add that. No, that that's really important. Uh uh, we're coming up on the time you had said we should that we should end uh self is uh, is a subject that really interests me especially in the in the psychoanalytic context um we had we had talked about following up on friday does that still work for you yep yep, yep. okay, okay. The schedule. Yep. all right great so let me, let me, let me, let me, let me,